Hello, everyone, and thank you um, very much for, for that introduction. Um, so yes, I am Jeanette Colasso. I'm going to be the presenter for today's event on how to reduce um, or human error reduction in GMP-related environments. Um, today, we are going to uh, have a discussion, or, or at least uh, we're going to have to try to provide with the um, well, or provoke the discussion on human performance and how to manage um, human performance while making sure that uh, we are um, complying with the expectations of regulatory agencies um, across the, the globe, because this is something, of course, that um, pertains to everything that is GMP. It doesn't matter if it's the FDA or um, which um, regulatory body we're, we're talking about. So today we're going to talk about human error reduction in GMP environments. We're going to talk about the effectiveness of a program to be able to address human error performance in a way that we increase human reliability and, of course, errors get reduced. And we are going to talk a little bit about investigation because it's a big and important um, piece of, of, the, um, of the puzzle in terms of um, understanding the problem, correcting it, and preventing it. So yes, we're going to talk about um, CAPAS, CAPA effectiveness. We're going to talk a little bit about that because it's part of what we need to address. <clears throat> okay, so like it was, like it was mentioned <clears throat> before we begin, um, I worked in the, in the industry uh, for, for most of my career and um, nine, almost 10 years ago, um, is that we started doing consulting. But what I wanted to um, share to you about this is that, uh, and the important thing about the bio is that um, this was created, this was born and raised while working in the industry internally, understanding the challenges, the reality of the manufacturing floor, the not ideal circumstances that we're reading books and see. Uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, all, all the time when, when we talk about this from an academia, academia perspective, right? And even though, yes, of course, we went to school for all of this, this is something that is practical, okay? So I wanted to put that out there because I was responsible to make sure that I would reduce human error. It was my responsibility as a tra training supervisor, manager, director, and <clears throat> all the way to um, being a human reliability director in one of the, uh, and actually that was my, my last position when I was working within the industry. So what I'm trying to say is it works. And it works because I never got fired. <laughs> I always got increases and, 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 and promotions. So it must be good. So pay attention because believe me, it took some time to figure this one out. And we did. And that's what we're going to share. So why talk about human error? First of all, because there's limited, limited knowledge on the, on, the, on the topic within our, our um, manufacturing sites, okay? So more than, than, it's not that we don't understand this phenomenon, it's that in terms of when we have to address human error situations within the industry, we really don't have the expertise. And, the, and, and that leads to being a problem that it's less address. I don't know if that's even a way to say it, if it's correctly, but I think I got my message across. So it's one of those things that's most left, um, is mostly um, ignored, not because we want to ignore it, it's because we don't understand it. So it does become, because of that, the major contributor today um, for nonconformances, for unplanned downtime. Um, recently, there was a study that was performed in Europe, and human error ended up being the number one reason for uh, unplanned downtime. And, and that's, that's a problem when we're talking about productivity, because again, this is a business, and we can't just focus on one area. It has to be the same amount of importance for safety, for quality, and for business. So we, if, if we're overdoing or, or lack of action in some of these, then we have to adjust, because they, they they need to coexist, and we have to be very careful that there are not uh, messages that are stronger than the other, because then one of them could suffer, okay? So 
It impacts productivity from OEE cycle time, throughput, customer service, you know, on time, um, release, all the, the key performance indicators that we put in place to, to try to drive our organizations to um, a successful result. And then, of course, we can get into some serious situations in terms of our regulatory standing, meaning, you know, getting citations for 83s, warning letters, and um, and so forth. Um, one of the of the things that I also want to add that um, I don't even know if it's in the bio, but I will um, anyway um, share it. I worked in in three, well maybe three, as a, as an employee in three sites that were uh, um, part of a very serious consent decrease. Um, yes, and I got there after. <laughs> Just in case, but what I'm trying to say is that we we I, I, I we understand the um, the expectations and 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 of course it was more from a training standpoint. But human reliability becomes a situation when you when you have to make sure you're complying with all, all these robust systems and people and that you don't have people dependent systems and then all of a sudden people were breaking all 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 the all the robust systems so how robust can your systems be if if your people can break it so easily so that's one thing that from a gmp standpoint it's going to raise aware or raise the question of what's happening um because a robust system is defined by making sure it it has good barriers of defense that will assure that at the end of the day, I can trust your product from all, um, um, from all the, the GMP angles, from all the, the quality attributes that are expected from purity, you know, identity, and so on and so on, and that we understand. So it is very important, but again, it's also one of the major reasons why there are accidents. So yes, it needs to be addressed because it's humans and humans are going to be there no matter what. I, and I have, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I do have bad news for artificial intelligence because my theory is that he, artificial intelligence thinks that they're the solution for human error. And I think that human error is the nightmare that artificial intelligence is going to have. How are you going to, come to, to, to go to that portion, that little three seconds of, of Captain Sully in, in trying to explain that last reaction that there are so many little details that are just human-based that probably that will be the nightmare at the end of the day, the solution is going to be precisely the problem. And I don't want, you know... Um, be negative here, but uh, you know it's 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 difficult to to try to uh, <clears throat> manipulate everything re with regards to human uh, behavior. So that being said, I also want to add, and of course, in GMP environments, we have to not only um, and, and and of course it, we we do understand that it's important to address this from a safety, from a regulatory standpoint, and from uh, a business and productivity standpoint, but not only that, it is actually a requirement from the agency. And I just want to refer to some um, some text on the regulation. I'm using 211, but we all know that GMPs across the world, at the end of the day, come from the same spirit. If you will, if you you know understand the ultimate reason for 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 these requirements, they are all expecting basically the same thing. So I'm just going to use 2.11 as an example, um, and um, specifically 2.11.22 when it talks about the responsibilities of the quality control unit. Um, and in this paragraph, basically saying, well, you do have to make sure there's quality uh, in, in the product, and for that, I'm going to give the authority to the quality control unit to, uh, to review production records, to assure that no errors have occurred, or if errors have occurred, that they have been fully investigated. And what does fully investigated mean? It's giving you a direction or an instruction to investigate the error. That means that human error is not a root cause. And it's right there. I want you to fully investigate the error because you're not supposed to have errors. But if you have them, 
I want you to fully investigate them, meaning get me the root cause. And that's the problem, that we have been finishing our investigations where the investigation and quest for answers should begin. And that's what we call the missing link in our, in our systems, because it's something that has been, um, it's, 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 we have oversimplified the problem to the point of just, saying, you know, we can't do anything about it. So, I, I, so in, your, in order to illustrate the magnitude of what I'm saying, <clears throat> let's just compare this to equipment failure. Okay, let's say there was a deviation and I needed to do my investigation and my conclusion was, my, my root cause is that it was an equipment failure. There is no way that anybody would approve that type of investigation with that root cause. That's not a root cause, right? That's what happened. I want to know why the equipment failed, which components, what was it about it? Was it during the cleaning? Was it during the setup? And then all of a sudden, everybody has a lot of theories and because we have the knowledge. But when it comes to human error, we say human error, period, which is exactly equivalent to human failure. Equipment failure, human failure, and from now on, I'm going to continue to compare or um, and, and, and directly compare equipment to humans, okay? We have to start thinking uh, about, and this is going to be a change in paradigm, uh, because we have to start looking at the human as if it's an equipment, and I know that's like, what? We have always been talking about, you know, human is your most important asset. No, no, you know equipment is the most important asset to you, and you better do IQ, OQ, PQ, GQ, all the cues you have to do, um, uh, preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance. Let me see when you get stressed because now I have to shut down. And then in the shutdown, I have to cancel the vacations because people don't need the shutdown. So we are nicer to equipment. And that's why once we start understanding that the human is going to have limitations and it's going to have the same uh, conditions and equipment, even though we can be better in some things or worse in some, in some others, we are going to understand the human a lot better if we, if, if we understand that we're talking about the human equipment within our process, okay? So if errors have occurred, you have to investigate the same way that you would investigate equipment failure. Human failure, now we have to start looking for the answers. Now, probably was not that like explicit when we talk about 211, but then Europe took it to another level and said, you know what, I'm going to be a lot more specific about what I'm expecting from um, human error in, in, in GMP environments. And this is what they say. I'm sorry, I'm just drinking a little water. Um, it says, where human error is suspected or identified as the cause, this should be justified, having taken care to ensure that process, procedural, or system-based errors or problems have not been overlooked if present. Appropriate corrective actions and or preventive actions, CAPA, should be identified and taken in response to investigations. The effectiveness of such actions should be monitored to and assessed in line with quality risk management principles. Okay, now I'm going to decode this message step by step. This is what they're saying. Let me get some, some markers here so we don't miss the point. Let me see, I think that this is with the, okay, perfect. So let me go back to, to, to this paragraph. It says, where human error, here, here is where we start, where human error is suspected, you don't even have to know yet. Once you start suspecting that this could be human error, or you have already identified it as the cause. And now let me, let me pause here because, again, human error is not a root cause. It is a causal factor, okay? Why did we have a problem with the, with the equipment? Well, the equipment is the causal factor. Not, now I need to, uh, to investigate what happened, okay? So the, 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 um, this is... And basically, this is what they're saying. 
as the causal factor or the cause, of course, this should be justified. Now, not only I have to make sure that um, I have to justify and make sure that, that I'm, I'm going to use the word blame, but that's absolutely not the word that we are going to continue to use later on. But I'm going to assign responsibility to a human. It better make sense. For example, well, my room went out of temperature. And what's the root cause? Human error. What happened? Did the person self-ignite? Because how can that happen? Oh, well, the problem is that the HVAC failed, and then there was an alarm that was oversensitive, and our MO was basically to silence it, so, uh, silence it all the time. So that's what we did. So you better not silence it again. <laughs> okay, that. Forget about the HVAC failing. No, that's not the problem. It's the human. So now you have to justify and say, well, in this case, in reality, the root cause of this happening is, is the HV, is the, is, the, is the failure that, of course, then triggered some other barrier of defenses that failed during the process. And, of course, one of them is a causal factor. And one causal factor is the equipment and then the, uh, the, the, the sensitivity of the alarm and then the, um, the, 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 the continuous behavior uh, on, on, on this type of action. All of those are causal factors, but why? Why and why and why? And that's where we have to continue. And then it says, have it taken care to ensure that process, procedural, or system-based errors or problems have not been overlooked. So now I'm telling you, you can't oversimplify the issue and overlook. Okay, we have to pay attention to anything that has to do with this. It's, it's a requirement. I'm just you know, talk about, talking about Europe, but I'm pretty sure, again, that this is the spirit everywhere. So, um, that they have been never, not been overlooked at present. Then it says, appropriate corrective actions and or preventive actions. And this is very important because CAS and PASS are two different things, okay? A corrective action is something that I do to correct what just happened and that this doesn't happen again. Preventive action is to avoid that from happening somewhere else where the conditions are similar and I can prevent it from happening. So I have to have either CAPAS and or preventive action, okay? Because it, and sometimes preventive actions are not possible and that's okay because this is the only um, way that this could happen. So, you know, actually, there is no way that it would happen again. So I can, it's, it's so, so what I'm trying to say is that we have been addressing G, um, human error in the GMP environment with, without preventing possibilities of having something from happening again. And that's one of the things that we will address this uh, 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 um, here, okay, and, and you'll see why this is, uh, I'm taking some, some time here. So corrective actions and or preventive actions uh, should be identified. So I want them to be effective, right, or appropriate. And in order to be appropriate, they have to be effective. And I have to monitor and assess uh, in line with quality risk management principles. I want you to to not forget this because what we are going to um, learn today in, in, in the model that we put together. Remember, I had to make sure we would manufacture for the whole world. So I had to comply with Anvisa, I had to comply with Europe, I had to comply with Chile, I had to comply with uh, um, FDA. We had, so l let's just look at the, the, the one that has everything to make sure that we comply. And it actually makes sense. So what you're going to see today takes care of each and every one of these com uh, components in these expectations that I just presented, which in turn is the same thing that the FDA wants. They're just giving us more details. Okay, so we uh, and and we'll and, and I'll come back to Europe um, uh, once in a while. That's why I wanted to uh, pr uh, focus a little bit here because we're focusing right now in GMP more than um, other areas, and this is what what I wanted to make sure that not only are we effective in the reduction and, and, and of human error and, and increase in human reliability, but that we cover everything 
that were expected from a GMP standpoint. So what's the thing about human error? And, and it's part of the reason why I ended up in human error, right? It's the reason uh, that, that most of us could um, relate and it's the training, okay? So this is the problem. And I, like I mentioned, I work being either a um, technical um, a, a specialist, supervisor, designer. I went through all the stages of the training department. And one, one of the, um, the major uh, challenges that, that I had to face was precisely being questioned by management in terms of, you know, Jeanette, your program doesn't work. The training program doesn't work. We continuously have retraining and retraining and retraining. And it constantly, you know, it continues to happen. Uh, so, so, so the training program is not working, and all of a sudden I'm like, you're right. If if that if retraining is happening, it's because people are not really learning. So when we came back to try to understand the situation, what we learned it was that it was not related to training the problem. And I went back. You know what? I know what's the problem with training. That training is not the problem. And then my next my next challenge from my general manager was, well, if it's not training, then what is it? And here is where the answers needed to be found because for the first time I didn't have an answer. I usually have one, whether I convince you or uh, confuse you, I'll give you an answer. And in this case, it was one of those, I, I, I'll find out, okay? So what about training? Well, this is the reason why, why we knew training was not the issue because training, training only, can only do so much, okay? First of all, we use training as vaccine for mistakes because it's what we do before releasing per people for independent performance. In GMP, you have to um, train a person, and if they're going to be doing critical activities, you have to do an on-the-job training, and you do have to do a, an on-the-job qualification and make sure you have that documentation uh, to demonstrate mastery of performance. So if you're doing this and you're qualifying on the job and your training program is defect and, 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 and your people are being qualified, then, and they can do their job because I'm, I'm, I'm measuring it, then it's not training because training is only effective to transfer the knowledge of what I need to do, the skill on how to do it and demonstrate that you can actually do it. Okay, so it's the knowledge, the skill, and the ability. If your issues are not related to a lack of knowledge, a lack of skill, or a lack of ability, it's not training. And when we went there and say, let me see the investigations and let me take a look at these deviations, <clears throat> when we looked, it was not that the person did not know that they needed to document. It's just that the person forgot to document. That's what, that, that's what the investigation says. Now, why did the person forget? Oh, good question. Well, there is an answer for that. The problem is that we don't have it yet. And here is where we say, it was just a memory failure, forget it, I can't do anything about it. Or yes, you can. Yes, you can do something about it. So of course, we want to, um, <clears throat> we want to think about this. But when we talk about training, ask yourself this question. Is this error related to a lack of knowledge, a lack of skill, or a lack of ability? And if the answer is yes to one of those, then there was something during the training that something was missed, and that's okay, then we, of course, retrain. Okay, and, and of course, but then we have to do it designing precisely for that lack of knowledge and not just go back and say, let's go through the procedure again. Now, that's not, uh, let's, let's just, you know, act based on data and, and with the intention to solving the problem, okay? Now, be careful because when you say it's training and you're admitting that there was a lack of knowledge, skill, or ability, I would have to question everything else that that person has touched before because you don't suddenly forget or, well, maybe nothing has happened because it's the first time this person doing it. So, oof, good. But the person has been doing this for 10 years and all of a sudden you say it was, it was, uh, the person did not know, then we have a problem. Okay, first of all, either it doesn't make sense or probably we have to work on maybe there was a sudden uh, amnesia and that needs to be addressed <laughs> or 
is really um, something that probably has been performed that way for so long, but nothing has happened before. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen um, act, uh, um, activities that have been happening for years before we detected that type of mistake. Critical things. So be careful. Um, <clears throat> new employees, uh, of course, when we when we talk about training, uh, is 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 important for new employees, new set of knowledge, skill, or abilities. If we're changing, we had a situation in which we were changing our aseptic manufacturing process from an aseptic area to isolation technology. So there's a different set of knowledge, skill, or, or abilities. Now it's a whole different story. And it's a little difficult to adjust to moving away from a clean room or, or aseptic area to now dealing with, you know, making sure the gloves <laughs> are okay. It's, it's, it's a different type of situation and it will be, uh, training is very important as, as well. But when we went back and took a, uh, took, uh, took a, a look at the data, what we found is that less than 10% of events are related to training. Okay, so that means that most of our efforts have been directed towards 10% of our problems. That's pretty ineffective, and that's something that I would immediately address because we are wasting very valuable resources resources that could be focusing on fixing the problem instead of continuously fixing the blame and, and then don't resolving anything, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the human once we understand human error. Now we know what they expect from us, okay, in terms of, 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 of um, the regulators. Now let's understand a little bit about the human and then we are going to marry these two together with the methodology and with the, with the, um, the practical applications at the end, okay? So now we're, let's, let's talk a little bit about the human equipment. So yes, to err is human, but to forgive is a good design. And I strongly believe this. There are many things that um, we can do to improve human reliability and that's what it's all about, okay? Yes, um, the, the, the uh, that that uh, the presumption that human error is the root cause is basically saying, well, I can't do anything. But in reality, you can change the, the design. So that we 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 have to expand our solutions to uh, to to other elements. So these were the facts. You remember that I was um, telling you in my story about the time that I was challenged and they asked me and my management asked me, well, if it's not training, why, what is it? Remember that story? Okay, so let me go back to it. Um, I, I had to look for the answers, remember. I, it took me years to, to give this answer back, but I found it. But I didn't find it within our industry, we had to get out of it, get away. And the first thing that we started finding was that there is another set of industry that are classified by the Department of Labor of the United States by being high reliable organizations. And these are organizations that have succeeded in avoiding catastrophes in processes that are prone to possible accidents and very dangerous. For example, FAA, chemical process um, um, manufacturing, uh, nuclear power generation, fire, forest, or, uh, and for, uh, forest fire, and so on. Okay, so one of the things that we found was, especially, and I'm gonna start with um, something that, that will start to change the way we look at these situations and, and break that paradigm of that old vision of human error. Now, and, and learn from the ones that really know, this is what we found. Yes, 99% of accidental losses, except for natural disasters, begin with a human error. So I do understand that most of our deviations are going to be human error. But they also say that root causes of accidents are management weaknesses. And that could be painful, especially when we're talking GMP environment, because if I accept these facts, 
then what I'm saying is that my systems are weak and that's why most of my deviations are related to human error. You can see it like that or not, but that's what they're saying. And this is good to a, to a point. Uh, well, actually, it's a very good thing to, 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 uh, to understand because that means that we have the control and we have the power to be able to fix it and to increase the uh, robustness. Remember, we, it's not that we have been doing it wrong. It's just that there is a missing link that has been ignored, and that's why we have to go back and say, you need to, we need to factor in the human. We forgot about the human. And now we have to um, incorporate human factors because we've been uh, uh, doing it for everything else, but we forgot that the human have capabilities in not, and not in a um, on purpose I'm not saying that but we didn't know that <laughs> even though we're humans we don't understand a lot about humans so what does the human error vision says well this is the old vision which is the one that we're going to forget today and is the one that says that human error is the cause of accidents and incidents meaning in this case the root cause the main reason and in order to fix it you must find employees inaccurate assessments, wrong decisions, or bad judgment, basically looking for blame. On the other hand, the new vision says, wait a minute, yes, human error happens, but it is a symptom of trouble deeper inside a system, and that's why we need to start our investigation where we finished with human error. So that's, that's, that's one thing that we will need to start doing immediately is that whenever we think that human error is the, the causal factor, here is where the new investigation needs to start so we can explain why I made that mistake. Then instead, to find the blame, what we want to do is understand. So what we are going to do is find how employees' assessments and actions made sense at the time given the circumstances that surround them because we have to assume and we have to um, come from a place that people want to do a good job so it's not you know uh, that there was a perp uh, you know it was there was no intention to do harm for some reason I thought that this could be a good idea and that's what we need to try to find out and you'll be surprised so not only, not only that there are good ideas, that it's the only way to do it. So probably we should evaluate those things. So the new vision says we need to understand the rationale behind people's um, assessments. And also we need to try to understand what is happening in the system that is allowing these type of mistakes that can be expected to cross the system and, um, and make it to the surface. It's very, uh, um, there, it, 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 it basically, if you have learned a little bit about or have read a little bit about human error, you have heard about the Swiss cheese model. That's exactly what we're talking about here. If the system has weaknesses and I don't fix them, then of course, at some point they're going to align and then of course there's going to be a deviation. All right, so yes, people don't wake up in the morning saying, yay, yay, today's the day that I'm going to make a mistake. That's my goal. I want to get in trouble. No, that's not the reality of what, what happens every day. Our, our people do want to do a job um, correctly. They don't want to do rework. They don't want to, to have to work with um, deviations. So we do know that people want to do a good job, but we also... In that sense, they need to understand what's affecting their performance when it happens. So what affects performance? Well, there are many things that affect human performance, just like equipment, thinking about equipment, humidity, vibration, um, all, you know, the way, you know, the, the, how much um, power, um, um, all of those things, right, are, are things that we evaluate in order for the equipment to function. It's not just one thing. So the same thing happens with the human. We have biophysical factors. It's our components. It's my senses. It's my, uh, it's my brain. It's my eyes. I, I, uh, everything that is biophysical that comes with me. Then I have external things that, that could have an impact. And this, it could be in, 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 if we're talking, that, for example, um, in facilities, Right? One external factor, which is a thing that could affect facilities, think about 
uh, an aseptic um, area and the airflow. So if I have an equipment that is blocking my my airflow, then that's an external factor that is affecting something that I need to protect or that it's affecting its normal function. So external factors, I have to um, interact with the equipment, I have to go under the equipment to get to some places, or I have to go around the equipment, or I, it, it's so many external things that, that I have um, around me. The systems, then of course, I do have systems, I have to uh, make sure that this happens before these, that there are rules, that there are um, gowning, that there are all of these systems that we put in place. And then, of course, there's the capability. So how much we can do. And we are very good at some things, but we are very bad at others. Just like equipment, you wouldn't ask a toaster to iron, right? It, you would understand that it can't. But then if it's a human, you say, I don't know how you're going to do it. You make it happen. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how we function. So that's why we have to be very careful that we are not Oh, you know, we are not ignoring um, this element. So sometimes we got put in a position where we don't have any other um, option. Now, so what are the types of errors that we see that happen? Well, this is basically the types of errors that, that exist. And we, we have four types of error, which are composed by two conditions or, or meaning um, two type of actions and the psychology of the mistake. So let me explain. It's four types of errors. Intentional errors of omission, intentional errors of commission, unintentional errors of omission, and unintentional errors of commission. So I'm going to start with intentional just to get that um, question that usually comes after talking about intentional error, because I just said that people don't wake up in the morning saying, yeah, I want to make a mistake. When we talk about intentional errors, what we're talking about is actions that were intentional but never were intended to do harm, even though I know that I was deviating from the rule, but I didn't know that it was going to explode. <laughs> I didn't know. Okay, so, so that's the intention. The, the, um, the, the, when we talk about intentional, there's no harm intended. If there is an action that it's intended to do harm, that will be sabotage, and sabotage is not a mistake unless you plan the sabotage and it doesn't work. If it works, there's no error there, so just then we address it in a different way, okay? So when we're talking about intentional, what we're saying is, you know what, this doesn't make sense, or um, it's, it's just a decision, okay? It's, 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 it's a lack of information, and this is where we need to try to find the reason why it made sense to skip a step. So an intentional action of omission is to say, I'm not going to do that step. I don't, I, that's unnecessary, and it's just holding us back. And so then we need to understand, but why do you think that? It, because it doesn't make any sense, because if I do this here, then at the end, it's going to go to this other step in which I would have to do it again. So, oh, so now either I learn something from the rationale, or I can clarify and say the thing is that if you don't do it here, this is what happens. Well, and, and then you can explain and make sense out of the rule. People break the rules when the rules don't make sense to them. So we need to explain the why. We need to understand the consequences, what could go wrong, because that's what's going to increase the level of awareness and my stress to the point of optimum performance and to pay attention and to self-regulate. If I know something could go wrong, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to make sure it's, 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 it's safe, it's, it's, it's happening okay. We know this. We understand this. If we, if we really uh, understand that what could happen, then believe me, we will try to, to, to be successful unless we don't want to be successful. And again, we already made a distinction. In terms of intentional errors of commission, it's like, you know what, I'm going to leave it, you know, a little bit more time because I think it's better later or I'm going to do a little bit less. I'm going to uh, increase the temperature so I can do it in less time. Well, then we need to find the reasons why people are making these decisions. It's because, well, we've done it so many times and nothing weird has happened before. So, so 
and then we would need to then either um, fix it or fix that that irrational thought that that is taking us or or driving our behavior to to bad decisions. Then, so in this case, yes, there is a lack of knowledge. That doesn't mean that it has to be through training. That doesn't mean that it has to be through a meeting. It's something that we can also think about when we're writing procedures and making sure that whenever there is critical to quality activities that could potentially put certain, um, um, you know, put certain qualities of the product, uh, um, I mean, uh, yeah, that, that could put, put the product at risk that we can incorporates those warnings and cautions so people have the information to make sure they self-regulate. And that's just one of the things that, that uh, we can do. But in terms of understanding um, that what we need to provide is there is some type of information and probably we are, we, we, we are um, losing that, especially these new generations that want an app for everything. There's always a better, faster, cheaper, there's always, and that's great, and we do want that, but of course we need to do it in a controlled um, way. Then on the other hand, we have the unintentional ones, and these are the ones that you forgot to document, you chose the incorrect sample, you chose the sample at the incorrect time, um, or you didn't catch that mistake, or you gave a check by and, 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 and did not check or did not see, whatever. This will be unintentional. This is not something that I make decisions. So my actions or lack of actions are not, I'm not aware. So retraining or discipline or this type of things, it's, it's, it's not going to help in the process because it's not going, unless it's training on, you know, memory skills and attention skills and lumosity.com and those things, then we're talking about a different thing. But going and retraining, remember, you have to sign. People know they have to sign. People understand. So in this case, what we're talking about are things that happen to us. So what we need to do is try to protect the person from that happening. If I don't want you to forget something, I have to make sure that I have either an alarm or some type of feedback or a checklist or something that will um, increase my, my, my awareness. And, and these are what we call attention grabbing features or, of course, without overusing them because then they lose power and they lose effect and they're just another step. Uh, to make a mistake. Um, intentional errors of commission in which I, I confuse something with, with the other. I, um, I uh, documented the wrong, uh, the wrong time or now it's something that I did not, I, I did not do um, intentionally. So now what we need to do is try to avoid that confusion. If I chose the incorrect, incorrect grease, well, probably a picture of the correct one will reduce the likelihood of, 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 of making mistakes, provided that you have them all together, which would be a, a huge risk. I would separate them or dedicate them. You know, I shouldn't. As much as you can, you want to eliminate the possibilities of mistake. But if not, then think about those barriers of defense. So though, that's why we can't address all errors in the same way. So what we need to do is then go back to our our process controls, and this is where we start understanding what Europe wants. I don't want you to ignore process, procedural, or system-based errors that are creating these conditions. So that's why um, we need to understand first what's the type of error so I can continue the quest for answers. So what are some errors that, that uh, those common causes for this? Well, memory failure, the multitasking myth, um, you know, Google it impossible that a human can really multitask. I can do different things in an amount of time, but I'll be sharing my resources of attention and I have to jump from one to the other. So yes, you probably want to rethink about the, you know, multitasking. It's not multitasking, it's just um, multiplying the tasks that are going to be linear. So be careful about that. Hurry, of course, we, 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 we don't really have that, that, that situation. Um, never. Nobody said that ever yet, I have heard. So, yes, we're always in a hurry. There's always something um, that, is, that is behind. So th these are all common causes. Stress, slips. 
the attention. We don't. We are not very good paying attention because we go into safe mode, into idle. You know, the screensaver in our brain. It happens. So the situation awareness. When is it that I need to grab your attention? So I have to very wisely use my attention grabbing features, my alarms, my my um, feedback from the systems. Overconfidence. People get confident once you know. Time passes and then we start to move away from the rules and deviate from the from the regulations from the from following the procedures. So there's and it's normal. It's, it's it's in human nature. We all do it and we get a little bit more careless and we are not really paying that much attention. It happens. Think about when you're driving the first time your new car. You're very aware, but once you're you're you're, you're start getting getting. Um, um, used to it and comfortable, you're not even thinking about what you're doing. So then we need calibration, and calibration comes from supervision, from correcting improper performance um, as soon as observed, um, with refresher trainings and with meetings to, you know, discuss. Um, I like GMP um, monthly talks. I think that they're very good, and I think that um, if everybody discusses the same topic every month, then um, you can share um, with the whole facility everything, and that counts for, for GMP training. It doesn't have to be a four-hour boring same course. You know, we have to also make it make, make sense. Um, and that, that controls behavior. Visual detection. We are very bad. Our visual detection is very similar to the attention. Our vigilance, it's, it, it, it doesn't last that much, so we have to to understand that people will have moments in which after some time there's nobody there because they already moved to another planet or just basically they dreaming or, or it's normal. And sometimes we don't see the things that are there. It's, we are not that good at visual detection. So that's why we want to understand um, human limitations, and these are just examples, but you want to understand human limitations because this can cause errors related to confusion, memory, and bad decisions, and, and that's part of, um, of understanding human errors. So what we did was that we found the information that we were looking for, we found the answers. Now we understand that humans have limitations. Uh, we do understand that there are going to be mistakes because they will happen. So we were trying to find the answers on what to do with it. So we looked and we found, and like I mentioned, we learned a lot from these type of industries. And especially the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is one of the agencies that has a lot of information that is very useful, especially when you're becoming an expert in human reliability, so you can understand how is it that we can help organizations? So I'm going to give you an example of what we have available, and, and if you're interested, it's something that you can absolutely um, look for yourself because it's information that is public. Just a second here. All right, so we, we learned from the um, National Transportation Safety Board, Federal Aviation Administration, the nuclear... Um, uh, regulatory Commission, and what we found was that there is volumes and volumes and volumes of ways to try and understand human um, error in, in, a, in a way that will comply with the expectations of, let's say, Europe for, 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 for the sake of understanding. And let me explain the reason why. For example, when we Go to data. What we have found is that yes, we can calculate human error probabilities and human error rate, and that's what we want to do. So from now on, I'm going to start talking about the methodology because I already talked about everything else, and so now I'm going to land this plane. How does it look like on the floor? Remember, we have to do something. It could be entertaining, but it's not entertainment. So what can we do? Well, we have to understand that th there are moments in which in which there is more likelihood. For, make, for making a mistake, because I cannot change the, con, the human condition, but I can change the conditions in which humans work. And this is just to give you an example. In this document, and just, it, this is just to illustrate the existence of um, 
information that we can use as, uh, as a benchmark, of course, uh, uh, and that we did actually to come up with what I'm going to present to you very soon. So for example, this is part of the a new reg CR 1278, which is the Human Reliability Analysis Handbook from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And they have estimated the human error probabilities for errors of commission, meaning I did it, not that I did not, okay? This is, I, I, there was an action. Errors of commission in reading and recording quantitative information from an annunciated displays, that specific. So I don't have an alarm, I have to make sure, so I want to know the human error probability for this type of situation by in these circumstances. So if I'm using an analog meter, it's my probability is 0 0.003, but if I'm using a digital readout and it's less than four digits, it comes down to 0 0.001, which is the lowest observable rate. And this comes from data um, from across industries, and this um, 0 0.001 is the lowest observable rate in critical activities and is pilots. And there is a very much internal motivation there that it's very difficult to replicate in other scenarios. So um, chart recorder, 0 0.006. Um, printing recorder, which li large number of parameters, then it, it goes up, and so on. Okay, so for example, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that we can put together a program that we can monitor and trend because it's quantifiable. So what we put together, it's a methodology and it's a program that it's based on a mixed methodology that's quantitative and qualitative to understand this situation and this phenomenon and make sense of it, okay? So this is one example. I have another example. This, this should be obvious, but one, one thing that, I've learned, that I have learned as a psychology is that my job <laughs> is to explain um, it's, it sometimes is to be, you know, the, the teacher of the obvious, but I need numbers. So this is one person addressing one alarm versus addressing 10 alarms. And we can see how is it that my reliability decreases. So my error rate increases because of the number of um, stimuli. So one in one is basically neg negligible, then two in one person, and so on, it continues to increase. So even though it should be obvious, now we have the numbers. So sometimes we do have to uh, go through this. So let's clarify expectations. There's volumes and volumes of data that tell us that people will make mistakes, that there is that point zero zero um, one. Um, excuse me one second. Sorry. So people will make mistakes. It's part of our nature. We cannot have zero deviations due to human error, okay? And, and let me try to explain um, something very quickly when we say that we can, um, that we can't achieve zero deviation. Okay, what, this is what, that, what I'm trying to explain. We don't, in the GMP environment, we don't do corrective actions or preventive actions to events that don't have the, um, the necessary criteria to be important enough to have a corrective action or preventive action. So we cannot have zero deviations uh, uh, due to human error. We have to wait until they become a deviation so we can do something about it. That's the reason why we can. But what we can do is that we can have zero major deviations due to human error because I'm going to try to keep them where we still can control the magnitude of the consequences. And this is something that I've never under, understand uh, or understood before from, from uh, 
uh, from the organization? Why is it that we don't put barriers of defense just like when we do with safety with near misses? We are actually saying, I don't want to know unless there is an impact. And that's why we can't. So, if, if it, so, so we do want to have uh, an opportunity to act on them as soon as possible. But if we're talking about the, G environment, the GMP environment and we don't do corrective actions for near misses or quality near misses, then we, ha we can't really have zero um, deviations due to human error. But if we want zero errors all together, then we have to eliminate the human interaction. And that's not, bad. That's not a bad thing. Uh, uh, we believe in automation. We do believe in uh, many, uh, uh, a lot of support from technology as much as we can to support um, productivity and, and the quality of our product. Of course, we're addressing human error, but of course there are limitations that we can um, leverage with our, or we can um, balance with, with technology and, and make a good team out of it. So some things can be done. Yes, 80% of the, of, the, of the success of any human error reduction program relies in making sure we incorporate human factors in the work design. And that then 20% that we address behavior-based and individual behavior um, meaning, you know, the culture, attitudes, um, common practices, and some other things that are more into the behavior-based portion of it. Because, again, we cannot change human condition, but we can change the conditions in which humans work. So how do we do this? Well, we do predictive maintenance. Well, no, we predict <laughs> where is the possibility of mistakes. And we have a tool for that, we will, and I'll show you very quickly. But what we want to do is try to predict where the possibility of mistake could happen. So we can put a barrier of defense, meaning either prevent or detect or correct or recover. Sometimes we cannot predict, but then we do have a situation that happens that if we don't address, we can predict it will happen again. And that's why we do a corrective action. So corrective action is basically predicting that something could happen again. So then in this case, I want to know if I want to prevent it. Remember, not everything can be prevented, but there are certain things that I can control the magnitude of the consequences. So I want to be able to detect it where I still have a good error recovery rate so I can correct and recover from it and then it doesn't have any impact. But since right now we are not taking a look at it from that perspective, we basically wait, then we do a corrective action to try to avoid the reoccurrence, okay? So this will be uh, uh, the, 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 the hierarchy of, of action. Why is it that we do it like this? Because prevention, it's not always necessary. Um, and what I'm trying to say sometimes is very expensive or and, and the and the impact is not that uh, important. So we have to be very careful when we use our resources because here is where you can get in the situation of, you know, buying a, uh, <laughs> an electronic batch record to reduce cycle time. You know, that, that, that's not for that. That's to reduce errors. But reduce cycle time, you have to re change the recipe. So be careful. Be careful. Um, on, on what is it that we're doing. Sometimes we have to make sure that we are using the, 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 the right resources. Again, this is uh, it's, it's the three main pillars, is safety, productivity, and quality. And we cannot forget about that because we still need to be competitive. So we want to be very careful with the use of resources. So what's the model? Well, basically, we're going to start with calculating our human error rate. So what you're going to do is that you're going to go back to your site and you're going to collect all the data for your last 12 months and you're going to count how many deviations, non-conformances, whatever you call it, okay, um, you have in your system, whether it's track-wise, whether you do it manually, whatever you use, and then you're going to count how many you had related to human error, okay? That will give you a number, and then you will go back and cut and, and check how many batches were produced or how many batches were manufactured, okay? Remember, not released, 
manufacturer. What we're trying to see is the volume of activities versus, or, or I mean, the, sorry, I, I, we want to see the ratio of the number of errors divided by how many opportunities to commit them. That's the, the, the general formula. How many mistakes divided by how many opportunities to commit them. We did, we had this many OOS due to analytical error, but then we had this many testing happening in the lab. That way you can see what's your human error rate and that will become your baseline because now we want to then demonstrate that we are going to be doing something to, um, to, to reduce those type of events, okay? So now we do have what is our baseline and this is the pre-measure that we need. Then after that, we are going to having that human, human error rate, now we are going to do a diagnostic assessment. And I'm going to be very brief on how we do this. Um, and, and, and you can, you can um, do it um, on, your, on your end. It's something that you can actually try and, and start doing tomorrow if you wanted to. We take those 12 months of investigations related to human error, and then we categorize and code them. So we actually look for the real root cause of the human error and we categorize and code them in the tool that I'm gonna that I'm gonna tell you in a minute. And you're gonna say, if I don't know the root cause, how am I going to categorize and code? Well, because the tool that I'm gonna give you has the root causes. You just have to find it. It's like find the root the 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 wall the, the 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 one that matches your situation. And it's gonna be very easy, and you'll see in a minute. Then. Once you have that, you will have a code for your root causes, so you will be able to see what are your major contributors, and we'll see how that looks like. Now, when we implement this program, we also do training on these two investigators, manager, supervision, and operational, because we are going to be changing the way we look at human error, so that's one, one of the reasons. Um, uh, and, and of course, it, it's, it's a whole another methodology uh, um, that, that uh, comes from this. Then, depending on the results, um, then we can do human or you can do human reliability assessment. And I say this because you will have enough information to do some on your own. There are others that will require training and I'll explain why. Um, internally, um, you can start working on in implementing those changes because you will be able to see your major contributors once you do your diagnostic assessment. And then you can start your culture uh, change process and start changing that 20% behavior of, of the culture and then of course monitor and trend and see how you're doing. So this is like, uh, this, this is a six step uh, process that we use when we implement it. This is what I used to do uh, when I was, um, every time I would get hired in a new company, I changed to a couple, but just because they wanted me to, okay, <laughs> because they wanted to f to fix problems. So I would be, okay, I'm here, I want to see the last 12 months, and then I would take my, my, my pen or Excel, and I would start doing my categorization. Then I, was, I would do my chart, and I would tell them, this is the problem that you have with human error, and this is how we're going to fix it. So what are the main concepts of this fabulous methodology? And when I say it like this, is because, believe me, we look for every answer in the book. Remember, I was remember, we hired every single company that would do human error and then some. And I would go and read and study more and go and go. And so I finally decided to incorporate that in my, in my, and incorporate this in my PhD. So that's the reason why at some point I was like, now I can create something. So this is the concept of how this all came together when we learned from these other industries, okay? So the main concepts of this model is, is these three main concepts. Basically, management systems, individual performance, and human performance, okay? So if we compare it to Europe, this will be basically the management systems. They don't want you to ignore um, process, procedural, or system-based. Well, system-based. Process and procedural are part of human performance. And then, or, it, or any other thing that could happen, which is, would be um, individual performance specific. And let me explain. Management systems that we need to um, 
that that are part of what we are going to be addressing at some point are investigations, documentation, risk assessment, material handling, suppliers, validations. There are others. This is just um, some examples. We have facility, policies, all of that. In the human performance concept, what we're looking for is to evaluate procedures, the human factors engineering, training, supervision, communication, and then the actual individual performance, meaning errors that are related to the person. And then that takes us to the next one, which is individual performance. That individual performance now has three main categories, which are what? Slips, mistakes, or violation. So slips are unintentional, mistakes are errors in my thinking process or bad decisions, and violation is basically a decision that has come from previous knowledge, consequences known, and probably it's more than once that this has happened. And then that will um, comply with that type of DBA uh, definition. Now, if we get to the individual performance area, then we need to deep dive, if necessary, to cognitive load, which is very small because this we will only use if it's necessary, and then I will explain, okay? It will make a lot of sense in a minute. <laughs> okay, I know, I know that it's a little com complex. It, it takes some time to simplify um, the stuff. So three main concepts is system, human performance, and individual performance. Now, how does that look like? Well, this is where it's going to start looking in, a, in the big scheme of things. Um, in, in, in it's going to start, I, I showed you some, some texture. Now I'm going to show you some structure for that texture, okay? Um, so how does it work? Well, this will be the, 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 uh, um, the path. I start with a human error, okay? That's, that's part of the model. Of course, that's what I want to do. So the first thing that I want to do is know if it's related to a system error or a human performance problem. So if we go back to the model, we have, sorry, let me go back. Human performance, individual performance and systems, okay? So when we come back here, that's what we have human performance and system performance, and then the individual is right here. So human error is either because of a system problem or a human performance problem. If it's a system problem, then I'm going to evaluate my management systems, which are investigation, documentation, facilities, validation, and so on. But if it's not related to a system problem, then I'm going to go through the human performance uh, problem um, path, which tells me that it was because something was missing in terms of human factors or the individual was responsible for the actual mistake, meaning it was a sleep or a bad decision, so I can relate it to a particular person, okay? And in which, in which case, then I would say, well, if it's management systems, then I'm going to take a look at which management system and then address it by fixing it. If it's related to some human factors, weaknesses in our systems, I'm going to go through the path of using the root cause determination tool. And if it's related to an individual, meaning um, memory failure, attention failure, or um, sort of, an, an, or, or, you know, culture and so on, I will move towards the cognitive load tool. Okay, again, I'm just taking you step by step. So that means that if my model takes me through this path, then it is my human investi investigation framework. And I start with my first causal factor, which will be human error. Then my problem type would be my Y number two. My cost category would be my Y number three. My near root causes will be the Y number four. And then my root causes are going to be my Y number five. And that's where we have the whole program. Now, where are those? And here is where we have what we call the root cause determination tool. And this is the tool that has everything that I was talking about. Let me tell you a little bit about, um, about um, this tool. And I just want to be very brief about it. The intention, first of all, is not that you can see um, you know, the details. It's just to illustrate the structure that I, that I wanted um, to show you here. But it's basically... Uh, an FMEA, if you, if you will, of 
anything that could go wrong, including equipment, okay, which is in this area, and I'm, I'm going to ignore for the sake of time, so I'm just going to start from, from this point forward over here, okay? So this tool um, is called the root cause determination tool, and it has all the reasons why people make mistakes, all of them. So when I told you, like, what your job is to basically take your investigations, go through the content of your investigation, and come to the tool and categorize and code. What is the structure of this, um, of this, um, of this tool? Well, let's follow this path. We start in the Y number one over here, which is human error. Then we will follow the path just like in the model. Is it related to systems or is it related to human performance problems? If it's related to systems, then this will be my systems. And then I will continue with my cost category, my near root causes, which are the ones that are in bold, and then the root causes underneath each one. If it's not a system problem, but it's a human performance problem, then it will be my next my next step will be which one of these categories and then determine which near root cause and root cause. So when we are talking about, um, when we're talking about uh, the structure, this is what we have. Y number one, Y number two, Y number three, Y number four, and Y number five, meaning that you have from the causal factor, problem type, cost category, root, near root cause, and root cause. You just have to find which one it is and select the code. Let's see how it looks like. Let's say that this is my deviation. Um, the, what happened was that uh, the, 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 quality, the quality event was that um, the valve was open out of the um, expected sequence or the, the correct sequence. So when we do the investigation, we start, let me see the procedure. What do you do? Are you following the procedure? Oh, yes, I was following the procedure. So the procedure was being used. So I'm not going to go through here. Um, was it misleading or confusing? This is something that I, I'm just using this as an example, okay, um, because I will start with a procedure. So um, it's it, it's it. Let, me, let me see the instruction and so on. So when you see the instruction, it's not misleading or confusing. It's actually very clear. Um, but this is what we find. It says, make sure valve 15 is in the open position. So now my step number four is to make sure that the valve 15 is in the open position. But when I get there, it's closed. What do I do? Well, I'm using it. It's not confusing or misleading. It's telling me what to do. The problem is that it's wrong or it's incomplete because I don't know what to do now. And I could say, well, in this case, it, 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 what we wanted to do is to provide that information. If it's closed, then open it. Or if it's closed, then call the supervisor. And you might say, well, I, don't, I can't give that instruction for everything. No, of course not. That's why you're going to do a criticality assessment and a what-if analysis with your procedures, but that's another story for another webinar. But what we're trying to say is that in this case, I could very easily say that my root cause for this event is C4C06, like over here, okay? And that way, I can go back and categorize and code all my deviations. So that's the beauty about the tool. And then you say, well, no, well, basically, there, there was a, a calculation error because there, it, it, it was really, you know, like a, a rounding um, situation. It was very difficult. Well, then in that case, it will be human performance, which is C. Then five, which is human factors engineering, workload, which is another C, and excessive mental math memory logic required. If that's the case, I'm just giving you an example. Once you have code them all, and that's the beauty of it, then, of course, we could be able to see what are our major contributors. In this case, equipment, because of this assessment was like this, so we ended up with, um, with this, with this uh, type of uh, areas of opportunity. So human performance problem, it's 43%, so I'm going to address that. But what about human performance problem? Well, this is my cost category. Most of my issues are human factors engineering or procedures or individual performance. And then I could also see 
exactly what about it, incomplete or not available. And this way you can make your corrections based on what makes sense. And in this case, I could say, well, even I want to know what the root causes are. So I can see most of my root causes are related to procedures being incomplete. So in this case, if I'm trying to reduce error across the site, I would do uh, a re-engineering of the procedures, paying special attention to making sure they're complete, that we do a what-if analysis or a FMEA or whatever it needs to be done, that we use a good verbiage, whatever ended up being um, a, a possible um, root cause established uh, in, in terms of procedures. So this way you are going to be acting on it. Now, if you're just talking about investigation and your root cause is C4, C06 because it's, your procedure is incomplete, then what's your, root, what's your corrective action? Let's, let's go back just a second. Procedure, let's say that, that your root cause is that um, is C4, C06, which is um, incomplete or situation not covered, your corrective action will be to complete it. And there you have it. Now you have your system-based, process-based, procedural-based, everything has been addressed and you're complying with all the expectations. Now, if you run into the situation, and I'm going to be very brief here because in this case, we do need to deep dive a little bit more in, 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 and we do have another webinar for this because it's way too much information in so little time and I want to answer questions. But when we talk about sleep mistakes or violation, which is individual performance, then we address cognitive load issues associated to it. And that's why what we do is that then we activate, for lack of a better word, a subcategory uh, that is called cognitive load. And that's why it was very small in the, in the model. Remember, that we uh, necessarily go there unless we need to explain a sleep and mistake or a violation. And then, um, in this case, we had to create this another tool to address cognition. And cognition is the process by which the sensory input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, stored, recovered, and used. But in science, in what we do, cognition is the mental processing that includes the attention of working memory, comprehending and producing language, calculating, reasoning, problem solving, and decision making. So this is responsible for memory, attention, failures, calculation errors, check. This is the area that will take care of it. But for this, we need to go even deeper, and we don't really have to go, have the time to go uh, uh, deep in this part, but you do have in your material the tool just as an example so you can see it, but it's basically trying to address one of the, um, one of the, uh, not one, to address categories that affect cognitive load, like the time that I have to do a job, the stress of the area, the complexity of the activity, the experience, the availability, and 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 um, the the uh, how well the procedures are, uh, the the design of the equipment, the hours of of working, and physical demands to avoid fatigue work process and supervision for coaching and to have people to um, to be able to do some type of consult, work environment and communication because depending on the level of existence and how adequate or inadequate they could be, they could, are, they could be the ones that put us in a position to overload our cognition and make mistakes. And like I told you, this requires a little bit more conversation but this is one of the things that we will um, incorporate as part of our, our, our evaluation, and this will be the 10 categories that I just mentioned. So what we would do is that after understanding that there are memory failures, we go to the areas and we created this tool that you have, again, uh, an actual um, attachment so you can see it. Uh, but it's one tool that really re requires some training to be able to use it effectively, but you can practice with it and see how, how much it works for you, um, in which we go to the area and evaluate if that was a memory failure, you know, how much time do you have to do the activity? Have, 
enough time or if there is a lot of stress or it's the the task is 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 moderately complex and it will give you a score from one to uh to five and that way we can see if we are having issues with overload in available time or um, where is it that the situation could happen. Um, we like to use the box plot because we can see the distribution of the data and false positives and negatives and making sure that there are no, you know, data points that are pushing or pulling our results. And that's the reason we, uh, we take it very seriously because there is some subjectivity to this assessment and that's why we recommend further training. But it will visually tell you, look, we have a problem with time. We do have a problem with available time because I can trust the data and probably we need to do a time study or do something about it. And, or we can also say, Actually, we can incorporate some little, some little, uh, a little bit more technology because the human system interface is very simple. So probably we can fix this problem by adding something here. And there you go. You got to the center. So much can be done. All right. So in conclusion, very simple. <laughs> if it's a lack of training, train. If it's an honest mistake, coach. If it's asking the impossible, adjust expectations, and if, you know, you knew better, then hold accountable. Just make sure you're very, very fair. Effectiveness of the program is almost 100% guaranteed if you implement it and, and you implement it correctly. These are typical resource, results from 4.7 as a human error rate to 1.9 in less than 10 months. So I now I'm going.